So as you can see, we are here for the topic of um, staying separate, fomenting suspicion, a fractured nation. And this session aims to actually really discuss on this issue. You know, like, you know Malaysia is a really rich country with its heritage and its, culturally, and its culture and much more. And is this a strength or is this a weakness? So this session will examine and explore that further. And are we being divided from the very reason why we were united in the first place? Are Malaysians being complacent to one another? Are there extremist works, ideologies that are employed in keeping Malaysians separate? And I think this is what we will be exploring uh, further today. Just a reminder to all, um, we are, even though we are all social distance, just be mindful to just uh, and adhere to the SOP and much more. All right. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite our speakers that will be coming forward um, to share with us. So first off, we have the Commissioner from the Human Rights of Commission of Malaysia, Gerald, Mr. Gerald Joseph. So for the last 25 years, Gerald has been a human rights defender and a trainer consultant at both local and international levels on human rights issues concerning the rights of indigenous peoples, elimination of racial discrimination and economic, social and cultural rights. So he has also pioneered and have worked on several issues pertaining to uh, human rights and much more. We are glad to have him here on board today to share with us. Next, we have um, Ms. Rosanna Issa. Thanks so much for joining. All right. Rosanna came into the women's rights movement in Malaysia in 1999, serving as project coordinator at Women's Aid Organization and NGO addressing gender violence. And she has gained organizational and program development experience with various institutions and NGOs, nationally, regionally, and globally. And this includes the Urban Governance Initiative, a program under the United Nations Development Program. International Women's Action Right, um, Women's Rights Action Watch, Asia Pacific, an organization coordinating the submissions and communications between NGOs and various UN international human rights mechanisms, and Musawa, the global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. Thank you for joining us, Rosanna. Uh, and last but not least, we have uh, Mr. Idin Ku, who is a poet, writer, translator, and journalist. He's the founder of Pusaka, one of the region's leading cultural centers. He has worked intimately with masters of traditional arts, including shadow puppeteers, musicians, dramatists, and dancers, researching oral transmission, cultural and religious politics, and aspects of ritual in traditional theater. He is presently also executive editor at the news sites, The Wipes, overseeing culture and lifestyle, news features, and the Southeast Asia desk. Thank you very much for being here, speakers. Uh, it's great to have you here. So friends, if you can see why am I having a laptop, because I'm also monitoring what's happening in Zoom. So I just have to manage the point in terms, you know, if there are any questions that were raised, especially my friends who have joined us online. If any questions, by all means, you can use the raise hand function online. Um, but to also, uh, just to give a reminder that, you know, if you can also turn off your video if you are not talking, and much more so that you can save the bandwidth. So that's just for those who are joining us online. I mean, we are trying something new. It's a hybrid, it's a new norm. So we are trying a hybrid model, but we will see how things go and much more. So, yeah, with that, um, without further ado, I will pass to our first speaker, Mr. Gerald Joseph. Maybe you want to share first, yeah. Yeah, you can choose either way. Uh, good morning, uh, colleagues, friends. Uh, good to be here. Uh, first of all, to celebrate that this is how human beings look like in a conference. This is a new experience. <laughs> and uh, we're good we can uh, be connected. Uh, number two also, uh, I feel a bit, bit disconnected with the Zoom people because uh, we're not seeing the Zoom people. So is there any chance we can see them also? Because uh, we only see ourselves. I, yeah, so, so we get a chance to, for us here to also know that they are together with us, uh, they are from different places. Uh, uh, so good morning uh, to, to colleagues. Uh, I'm very happy we have uh, His Excellency Dr. Peter, uh, the Ambassador of uh, German Embassy, YB Ganapati Rao, YB Senator Ismail Yusso, uh, Mr. Kedar Podiel, who is uh, probably new to many of you, um, the Human Rights Advisor to UN uh, Malaysia, and my fellow colleagues, uh, congratulations, Comas, it's the uh, 10th anniversary. So I think uh, Comas deserves a clap for surviving for 10 years on a national conference, right? Okay, um, 
I think um, discussing about this, if we are still discussing about this after 10 years, it already speaks volume uh, where we are in Malaysia, right? Uh, so the, the topic uh, this time around is uh, how fractured is our nation? We've spoken about it in so many different ways uh, and we've tried to appeal to governments, to society, to organizations uh, to, to come out of this, uh, this, this staying separate, no? Uh, you kn so, uh, yeah, okay, I see that. So first of all, I want to put it on uh, a reminder for us that um, the reason I put this is that there's no country in the world that does not have what we call a multicultural, multi-ethnic society like Malaysia. It's so unique. I don't think we are so unique. We are among many nations that have this history of different nationalities. So the more we move away from saying, oh, we are special, so we need to treat it with uh, you know, care, it only means that we don't want to move uh, forward. And this is why I think every country has minorities. It's how we deal with them in the framework of equality, uh, in the framework of uh, non-discrimination is the test of whether we are a good society, whether it's a good government in place, whether we have good laws and policies. So just to, to, to help us put this in context, there's this, uh, you can Google in the world population's uh, uh, website, the, the, there's this thing called most racially diverse countries. Huh? So Chad, I think, is a small country in Africa. Uh, they have 8.6 million residents, 100 ethnic groups. Togo, 37 tribal groups, 39 languages they speak. Canada is one of the top 20 most diverse countries, I mean, so which means they have many ethnic groups. Uh, so, and then if you go on further, maybe this is a bit small for you, but uh, if what I'm going to, um, in Chad, they are one of the high ends, so the ethnic fractionalization means Many, many, many ethnic groups, they are 0 0.862. Uh, if you can't see, I'm sorry, but it's in the high end. Huh? There is many ethnic groups, that's all we... Then the next one I want to show is uh, Canada, 0 0.712, Togo, 0 0.709, which means these are the high end of many ethnic groups in the country. Malaysia, we are in the middle range, 0 0.588. So I think first thing to get it right, is don't use this as an excuse that we are super special, the treatment of equality we cannot manage. You know, it's wrong. Let's not peddle this misinformation. I, as preparing for this yesterday, I also learned myself that this thing called Inclusiveness Index Measuring Global Inclusion and Marginality. So there is a, this is a Berkeley University. They have a, a study center there, very interesting. Uh, and the first two is the high-end ones, like you can see high and medium-high. And Canada is in the high group. So I want to make the correlation between Canada being in the, one of the 20 most ethnically uh, fractionalized, I mean, many ethnic groups there, but they are in the high end of inclusiveness. Uh, this you, uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, argue you can Google this later, it's by the Haas Institute Inclusiveness Index, uh, Berkeley University. And then you look at Malaysia. Malaysia is in the low end. So remember, Malaysia is the middle group of countries in terms of ethnic, uh, multi-ethnic uh, communities, but we are in the low end of inclusiveness. Then you look even on the top left, Chad, which I said earlier was in the high end, they are medium-low. My point being, there is no excuse for us to do better. How can we keep saying because we are so different, we are, you know, Malaysia is, ah, yo, we are a special nation. It's not. Our politicians are special. Oh, that's the reason why we have so many problems. Uh, YB, I'm not uh, directing it at you. <laughs> oh, it's the political uh, game that we need to unpack. So that's the first myth that I think we need to move past. Eh? Uh, and just to help you understand the in indicators, oh, sorry, maybe I did it, I'm not sure whether I... 
Yeah, so this was the, what I showed earlier about Malaysia being in the low section, right? This is what they look at for inclusiveness index. Outgroup violence, political representation, income inequality, anti-discrimination law, rates of incarceration in the prison, because that's how indication is. If your country is this population, but the prison has a different ethnic group that is very high, uh, that is also an indication, and immigration and asylum policy. Very interesting, I, I mean, I learned this yesterday, so I really need to learn more. Maybe we can all take a time to reflect on this. I want to move from here then to this point of democracy. I mean, I'm not, uh, I don't need to educate us on democracy. We know it's about the people, democracy means people, power of the people. We've heard all these words, and these words become very relevant as elections come closer in, Malay uh, in Malaysia, right? The speeches will say, you have the power to choose and all that. But also, it's the, the concept of, is it the rule of the majority? Where do minorities uh, come into play? And democracy should not be about the rule of the majority. It's a government on behalf of all the pe people according to their will. That means everybody's will in the nation. It's not majority. Because if, if majority rules, then we will have the tyranny of the majority. They will decide what uh, befits them and then forget the, the rest. Some quotes, I was trying to inspire myself yesterday. All too will bear in mind the sacred principle that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable that the minority possess their equal rights, and the word, eh? equal rights, which equal law must protect and to violate would be oppression. And this is the state of Malaysia. Is There's many people feeling oppressed because of the gameplay of separating a nation, fracturing a nation because of ethnic identity or religious identity. Of course, Nelson Mandela, there was Thomas Jefferson, yeah? Mandela has this to say, it is not our diversity which divides us, it is not our ethnicity, our religion or culture that divides us. Since we have achieved our freedom in South Africa, there can only be one division amongst us between those who cherish democracy and those who do not. And I'd like to make this clear that if people in political power get involved in democracy, you will have to answer this question. If you cherish democracy, you cannot be playing the game of supporting one group over the other. I picked this up from Alisa Wahid in a presentation in Indonesia. She said the concept of majority, where there's a push for majority rules, meaning numbers. So the danger is that it can be religious-based majoritarianism, which means those in power can decide religious sentiments in politics because you are in power. A growth of religious chauvinism. So you've got so much power that you will decide this is the flavor of, of the country. And this should not be it if we are thinking of uh, what was said by Mandela and Thomas Jefferson. This brings me to the heart of my own reflection. What grows this feeling in our minds in Malaysia, this feeling of fractured nation, of uh, staying separate, is some people, many of us are taught, I am right, this is it. You don't come and try to disturb what Malaysia is supposed to be. Eh? Some things, I am privileged because of my ethnicity, my religion. This is how Malaysia is. Who are you to, to try to talk about equality? Some believe and thought, my religion is more sacred than yours, so I have more rights over you. Some would then say, this is my history of this nation. Sejarah. Our sejarah writers also take a different... Uh, uh, a certain view, I think Idin Ku is quite an expert on sejarah. I leave that to him. But this is how history is. You have to accept it, okay? If you are number two, number three, you just have to accept it. And then some will say, this is how the deal is done. They use the word social contract. So if you are unequal, if you are oppressed, well, too bad. This is how the deal is done. There is no deal if we are human beings. There's only one deal, that we have dignity, we have equal rights that must be respected uh, by all. Of course, the other one is, this is my land. We came here first, we, we conquered the land, so it's ours. The rest are all pendatang, okay? Although, you know, ironically, many of our politicians' grandparents still live 
in either Indonesia or India or China or another country. But that does not matter. But it still says, this is my sacred right because this land belongs to my ethnic or religious group. I have more rights than minorities because too bad. Lah. Every country, the majority will rule. I am, and then the other part is that once you want, at one level, those in power for the majority will push. And then at another end, they will say, I am threatened, I must defend at all costs because the ethnic minority, maybe the Chinese, Indians or others, are taking away our economics, our political position, they have an agenda, and this is sold. Huh? I am easily confused on faith matters. Have we not heard this over and over again? Every time there is a decision on equality, there's a counter-argument. This is may confuse the faith of some people in the country. I'm a little bit surprised because I think all the major religion, you cannot, be, you cannot shake the, the, the faith basis or the religious basis because they've been here for thousands of years. And your faith individually cannot be confused by human rights or equality decision because it resides in the value of all our religion. So if you are confused so easily, that speaks about the faith that you carry in yourselves. You know? It's got nothing to do with the decision on human rights or religion. This was the same argument for ISAT. ISAT is a danger, it may confuse people, it will take away our rights. So every time there is confusion when we speak about equality and human rights. Also, Reality speaks dangerously sad stories of Malaysia. Only certain ethnic identities can occupy high office. There was a discussion at one time, the Prime Minister must he or she only be a Malay. Then some said, no, it's, it's silent in the constitution, but by convention. But we know some, some chief minister's uh, positions in some states state he or she must be Islam. So, and then we look at the positions of the director generals or the ministers mostly are uh, only one ethnic group. Why? Why is that? Shouldn't it be competency, merit, e and the concept of equality that you get there because you can make it there, not because of identities, you know? Only one race is the richest, so we must do, we must outdo them. So this is the counter. Like, the Chinese have taken everything, so we have to stop them, you know? So it's always ethnic. Either you control or you feel you are threatened, eh? And human rights that defend rights of people in Malaysia will take away what rightfully belongs to the majority in the country. This is what I mentioned earlier. This is what grows in our mind. This is what sold, uh, sold to us to keep us staying separate and to keep our nation fractured. Only equality can be the antidote for such regressive policies and politics in the country, sadly. And as a commission, we keep wanting to push the rights of all in Malaysia. But if you are seen as lesser than the other, you will come say, I feel discriminated. We get complaints like that in the Human Rights Commission. Then we have powers to investigate, to find out why this policy. But so many more cases are not investigated in the country. So, my friends, I say this as my own reflection that it is time we stop this myth or this lies. And I'm inspired by, I was looking for some quote in Malaysia to help me through my presentation. So I found this quote by P. Ramli. And this is actually quite a damning uh, <laughs> reminder. It's from one of his movies. Kamu tahu kan dia itu penipu. Muka dia pun muka penipu. Yang kamu bijak pandai, yang boleh kena tipu dengan dia, pasal apa? Kamu tu yang bodoh. So we cannot sit and accept and blame the others. Blame the politician, blame the NGO, blame the, the conservative groups. But we have believed it. We have taken it. And P. Ramli said it. You and I are the ones that are bodo. Bodo means ambassador, stupid lie. You know? We have taken in all the lies uh, and we believe the lies, although we are supposed to be very smart. So, so I think this is, uh, maybe the time is for us to call out what is not, uh, not right. And so that we don't become bored also because of our silence. Yeah? So, maybe some suggestions to think about moving forward. 
uh, we cannot be silent as hate is manufactured and hate is propagated and promoted. We see that online, we see that sometimes in policy speeches, it should not be allowed to, to happen. We cannot be silent. Okay? We must expose those which promote racial hatred or racial supremacy using political party, social organizing, or religious affiliation. We must expose, we must say this is not right. This is not the Malaysia we want that speaks of inclusiveness. And let's not allow Malaysia to descend to dangerous waters where two sides of rights exist. I know many people don't want to speak about this, but many people feel this. Two sets of people exist. The majority one, the minority one. Those who have in the large ethnic group or religious group, they have all the advantages and policy and direction. And those say, how come I'm left out? So, okay, 60 years ago, there was a need for constitutional alignment to make sure everybody gets a chance to come forward. We are a mature nation 60 years later. So that argument of keeping two sets of rights cannot be allowed. We need mass education on human rights inclusivity. So Akam does uh, human rights education. Comas does non-discrimination education the last, uh, since 2006. And finally, let's, let's not allow Malaysia to be a base. And this is the word extremist thinking can be easily peddled by local or foreign leaders in the name of race and religion. So my conclusion is that Extremism, these ideologies that you can be better than the other, you have more power than the other, is what I call extremists. And this is easily peddled in the country and we cannot allow that to happen. We know, for example, foreign religious speakers are invited here to be speakers and they peddle one religion over the other. You know, people are invited, or even ourselves, to, to inflame hate speech against the other. Beware of the Chinese. They will take over. Beware of this community, beware of that. And this beware for me is dangerous. And I think it is time we stand up, not be silent, so that we don't fall into the category of P. Ramli, who is actually blaming it on us. There's nobody else to blame but us. So I look forward to overcoming this suspicion and a fractured nation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jared for the sharing and the insights. I think Jared has given a framework in terms of you know, giving us and presenting to us some of the statistics in regards to you know, um, what really constitutes uh, a multiracial country and much more. And so what then defines inclusiveness in terms of outgroup violence, political representation, income equality, and much more. And he also presented the notion of democracy and how is it should not only be focused on the role of the majority, but if the government is there to govern as a functioning democracy, then it should govern on behalf of all the people. And thanks so much for the whole uh, key points in terms of the narrative and why we need to be really cautious, especially in terms of preventing racism from becoming an extremist ideology in, in the far end. Thanks so much, Jared. Right, um, friends, I would like to now just uh, invite uh, the next speaker, Rosanna, to come forth, forward to just uh, share uh, a few points in regards to the topic that we have. Rosanna, please. Good morning, Selamat Pagi, um, and uh, thank you for organizing this Pusat Kumas. Um, very important um, conference to have. Um, it took a long time coming from last year, and glad that you know we're here. And I almost didn't make it as well because my car broke down in at the Federal Highway right in the middle lane. So you know you feel like one of those big idiots where you're just like <laughs> cramming everyone up. You know, it was tr heavy traffic today. So I just want to acknowledge the hero in my life, my husband, Mustafa Kamal, who came with another car so that I could be here. Okay, so um, what I will be talking about today, sorry, so this is the ticker, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry because part of my presentations, um, you know, the, the texts are actually in uh, Basel, um, Malaysia. 
Um, but what I want to go through, through today is really uh, to talk about what is it that we are dealing with, and essentially we're dealing with narratives, issues, and expectations that are intertwined. Uh, what we are also having to deal with are recommendations that are vague and calls to stay within our parameters to not rile up the situation. What we need more of essentially are spaces and models for reflections and conversations. Um, and as well as the participation of the public um, in terms of our cultures that goes beyond appreciation. I think people really need to be involved in cultures. And I think Edim can definitely speak more about this. I have very little to say, but I think it's, it's something that's human that is needed, that will, you know, bring the side of us that we can, you know, so that we can better connect to one another. So, um, so <clears throat> what I'm sharing here today is a published interview in Sina Haryan uh, from January last year. Because, and I chose this because it's a very interesting, you know, statement. It's a very long interview. Um, and it reflects very well the challenges that we face when we are dealing with the issues of racism, essentially, and it's also intertwined with religion as well. However, I will only be sharing parts of it because uh, there are points from the statements that I want to underscore, and also because it's very long. But um, before I begin to take you through it, um, essentially, we all know that these issues have been carrying on for so long that they have become very difficult to unravel, mainly because the narratives of the issues that we are dealing with and the expectations of how we are expected, uh, and the expectations of how we are expected to deal with them, you know, all intertwine. Um, so this is the um, issue of the um, Tanglo, the Chinese lanterns that was uh, hung at uh, Pusat Banda Puchong um, last year. So they were accused of saying that, you know, hanging these lanterns in school uh, goes against the federal constitution, uh, particularly in relation to um, Article 3.1. And the complaint was made by um, a, a lawyer called Muhammad Khairul Azam Abdul Aziz, who's also the vice president of Parti Bumi Putra Perkasa Malaysia, um, a party that was founded by um, or, or led by Ibrahim Ali. And uh, in the social media, he uh, said that he received complaints from many parents um, who felt that the decorations um, were an attempt um, to spread um, the belief of other religions towards Muslims. Yeah? Um, so that was the issue. Now, in terms of the Sina Haryan commentary, so what happened was uh, um, this person had written to say that saya melihat tindakan tujuh menteri turun ke sekolah menyelamatkan tanggung tidak produktif. So the seven ministers who came, you know, to show as a show of support, um, that this action was not productive. I thought it was fantastic, but he didn't think so. Um, so, ia hanya menyebabkan orang Islam yang tidak benci tanglong sekarang semakin benci dengan tanglong. So, it caused the Muslims who didn't hate the tanglong before to hate the tanglong now. Um, and they can differentiate. Mereka boleh bezakan apabila isu jawi diasak oleh Persatuan Lembaga Pengurus Sekolah Cina dan pemimpin bukan Melayu, pemimpin-pemimpin Melayu senyap. Ini menyebabkan orang Melayu marah. Ya. Yeah? So when it came to the Jawi issue in the previous year, in 2019, you know, they could differentiate between the support. So this was also in reference to the Pakatan Harapan government. Yeah? So when the issue of Jawi happened, you know, the ministers, uh, the Malay ministers were all silent. But on this issue, you know, they came forward and they came to show support. Or, or at least to break the... the, the the, the, the tension, you know, that this is really something that's acceptable to our culture and our society. Um, now, he also said, Saya bukan seorang chauvinist. I'm not a chauvinist. How much time? And history, you know, has uh, shown that, you know, I've lived in, right. within the Chinese community and so on and so forth, yeah? And so I've experienced what it was like to live in harmony. And, um, but when I look at the situation now, Saya rasa wujud pengurusan yang salah oleh kerajaan sekarang. 
So it's the mismanagement of the current government with regards to this situation. Okay. Then he goes on to say, leaders, you need to do something to stop all of this. Don't let it be. Uh, we have allowed the Jawi issue, the Dr. Zakir Nai issue, be for, so long, for, for a few months. And those who are opposed to this are the leaders, um, are the leaders in, in the current government itself. Whereas, you know, the issue of Jawi, um, uh, it was the government who had proposed it. So, what, what is this? What's going on? So, my call to the leaders, tolong lakukan tindakan yang tepat, so do something that is right, dan bukannya tindakan bersifat popular semata-mata. So, do not take a very populist approach to, um, or popular approach to deal with the matter. And, um, yeah, so, so you see that in terms of the writing, it started with the issue Tanglong and then it went into the issue Jawi. Yeah, so it's all, that's why I said, you know, it all, it all comes together. Yeah, and then, um, so the, the Jawi issue was raised. And then he also says that, you know, Saya keluar untuk memberi seruan kepada pemimpin, kepada rakyat dan media, jangan apikan ini lagi. Yeah, so to the leaders, to the public and to the media, please, you know, stop inflaming this. Um, jangan sampai terbakar, terutamanya portal-portal, kalau netizen itu memanglah kita faham kerana mereka emosi. So calling on the big portals, you know, you have a huge responsibility here, whereas, you know, when it comes from the netizens, it, you can understand because, you know, it, it, it comes from their own emotions. And then, um, he went on to say kehidupan mereka susah, ekonomi tidak baik, mereka emosi, tetapi portal-portal yang besar mengapi-apikan. And then he brought in the other issue of Dr. Zakir Nai, whereas where an examination question uh, had, um, uh, was brought in uh, into the exam paper. And he says it's just a small matter. It's yes, satu isu kecil. Selain dalam soalan dalam subjek etnik dan di peringkat universiti. So it's an ethnic subject and it's at the university level. So we should be open to ideas like this. Tapi, but Lim Kit Siang also commented. Yeah. Jadi saya rasa kalau orang macam Lim Kit Siang pun ambil isu yang... So he's saying that you know, if Lim Kit Siang also pays attention to all these small issues, um, then, you know, um, it's going to be, uh, you know, you're going to have all these jago-jago, uh, small heroes to come um, and, and be the champions for, for their race, for, for, yeah, for their race. Um, but they are champs, champions who think very small. Um, if you are a big thinker, then you would not do um, something like this because this is really a small issue. So he defines it as a small issue, yeah. And then he went on to say, Orang Melayu tidak marah ke? Okay? Like, wouldn't the Malays be angry? Bila kamu semua bercakap, kamu tidak kaji kesannya. You did not see the consequence because you want to be a hero. You want to be a champion of the Chinese, of the Indians. And then the Malays will then um, um, balas balik to retaliate, to become champions as well. Jadi, untuk sebarang tindakan, you know, there will be consequences. Yeah? So, hentikan. All right, so stop it. Leaders, stop it. He doesn't say how or whatever. Fine, you know, I think, I think you know, politicians, if, if he's, he's handing this job to the politicians to do, then you know, polit politicians need to think about it. Someone is not muted in Zoom. Yeah, please. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, all right. So the thing is, at the end of the day, he says, yeah, sepatutnya lagi tinggi kita sebagai pemimpin, so the higher up we are as leaders, you know, we should be more intelligent about this. Sorry, uh, can you just mute? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, all right. all right, great, thank you. And he says, jalan penyelesaiannya adalah bertimbang rasa, yeah? So basically, the way forward to solve all, all of this is really to be mindful of one another and to give and take. Alright? Kalau kita biarkan selama 20 bulan, 
didebatkan secara terbuka so we leave this open for 20 months to be debated openly and the small minded leaders with their loud voices you know menyebabkan isu will cause the, the issues to be much bigger and to um, um, membakar semangat orang Cina yang tidak faham isu jawi itu tiga surat mereka ingat hendak tukar agama ke okay so that's fine but you know this kind of narrative i mean um, when i read this and then i remembered of um, a, a graphic a picture that i saw uh, which is so this is specific to women yeah you know it says that you know wanita yang baik tahu tempat mereka good women know where their place is and then um, and you see you know all these women are situated in you know boxes that are shaped and they can't move out they can't go beyond um, and they have to read so that's the expectation uh, of women essentially and I felt that you know when it came to um, the discourse on this particular issue I felt that this was what it was that we are told to just maintain in our boxes yeah um, um, maintain your boxes that different races, Malaysians, you know, this is how, you know, um, different races of, of Malaysians are expected to be. You know your place, not get out of the sets of prejudices that I have carved out about you. If you get out of it, I don't know how to deal with you. And maybe I don't want to deal with you. And I'm just going to use all means and ways that you are offline and you better get back in the box of who you are and I expect you to just do it and be happy with it. So, now the person who made this statement, interestingly, uh, further down, you know, uh, launched a campaign called Uninstall Hatred and Reboot Harmony. And I think it was for a good cause. I think, you know, he really was trying to simmer down the tensions. Um, but really, I mean, how do we uninstall our hatred, our prejudice, our biasness against one another, like we, like like a software or an app, when essentially our operating system is so flawed to begin with, yeah. And in terms of, you know, the 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 different groups of people that he had um, uh, laid out, you know, the the, the leaders. Um, you know, and I, and I would think that it's not just the leaders, uh, not just politicians, but I, I would like to think that it included everyone, maybe not, but I think when we talk about leaders, we need to include, you know, leaders of um, communities, faith, um, politicians, groups, you know, everyone, everyone has a stake in this, that all of us are actually accountable um, to do something about this. Okay. So now I go to, um, so this is where I said, you know, about the recommendations, they are vague. Um, even, you know, I mean, um, outlining what we have, you know, in our, the recommendations that we have so far, I think we need to go much deeper. And I think what is really needed um, are spaces and models for reflections and conversations. And this is where I would like to um, call everyone to uh, think about ideas um, launch of this campaign that they had yesterday. It's called uh, Kita Bukan Kami. And um, they have this um, project where you bring people together, um, you give them a certain setting in terms of, you know, how to have conversations about race. And I think it's very interesting. Um, and it's something that we need to perhaps do more often. Um, because the internet and the social media really doesn't necessarily support having conversations where you have to deal with the reality of dealing with human beings and having the humanity, you know, of um, during the engagement, you know, because this this is not just about, you know, you, you throwing something on Twitter and then somebody, you know, um, say something back. You know, it really requires for people to come together, to be honest, to be open, to listen to one another, to reflect, to sit with the discomfort of what other people are saying, and then you as a person, how you are receiving all of this, um, and how you feel about it. And um, 
and of course, it's within the parameters of that you will be able to have a conversation that's respectful of one another. And I think that is really urgently needed more of, you know. Social media is great, but I think, you know, we are losing our humanity in some ways, in a lot of ways, essentially. And so, I would also like to um, finally draw attention to this term called, you know, where it was said earlier, you know, I'm not a chauvinist, saya bukan chauvinist. And also earlier, um, you know, when the Kalima Allah issue came out a couple of weeks ago, there was this woman called Wan Ashima Kamarudin. So she went on a whole spiel about, um, you know, her thoughts and, you know, everything came out. It wasn't pleasant to hear. But there was also, she had used that term as well. Saya bukan racist, yeah? I'm, but I'm talking about the Chinese parliamentarian, you know. So that video is no longer up there, yeah, but uh, we managed to catch some notes from it. But this is the thing that we also need to talk about in relation to, um, you know, Saya bukan racist, because I think we do need to do something about it. It is uh, when people claim that they are not racist, um, that it's, um, it's not useful, you know. And uh, I actually would like to refer to the work of uh, um, Dr. Ibram M. Kendi. Yeah. So he is a professor of history and international relations uh, in the US. Um, and uh, he's the founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at, at the American U University. And um, he, he's, you know, uh, uh, he's written this. Uh, definitely, I mean, context-wise, context you know, we need to examine it for ourselves, but this is something that he really calls us upon to do in order to dismantle racism. So, bila saya kata, when I say I'm not racist, I look at racist, what's the problem with being not racist? So it is a claim that signifies neutrality. I am not a racist, but neither am I aggressively against racism. But there is no neutrality in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist isn't not racist. It is anti-racist. So what's the difference? So he says that one endorses either the idea of a racial hierarchy as a racist or racial equality as an anti-racist. One, one either believes problems are rooted in groups of people as a racist or locates the problems in power and policies as anti-racist. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as anti-racist. So there is no in-between safe space for not racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. And so this may seem harsh, but it's important at the outset that we apply one of the core principles of anti-racism, which is to return the word racist itself back to its proper usage. And he says that racist is not a pejorative. It's not something that you can throw as a slur. Yeah? It is not the worst word in the English language. It is, not the, it is not the equivalent of a slur. It is descriptive, and the only way to undo racism is to consistently identify and describe it, and then dismantle it. And the attempt to turn this usefully descriptive term into an almost unusable slur is, of course, designed to do the opposite, to freeze us into inaction. And I think this is something that we definitely to just you know, need to immerse ourselves in, think through. And when we have conversations, I think we need to start from ourselves. You know, Am I not racist or am I anti-racist? Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Rosanna, for the sharing. Um, apologies for the technical error of which would be there's some overspill of sound from Zoom earlier. Um, and I, I believe that there are also some, some technical glitches that you have found, uh, especially for those joining us virtually, that some of us may sound like chipmunks, uh, but we are currently really sorting out all those technical issues at the back end. Uh, but we hope that all will be, will be done and cleared. Uh, in the next few minutes and much more. Right, thanks so much, Rosanna, especially in terms of sharing in terms of, of the narrative of racism that we have in Malaysia today. Um, and of course, you know, how people are only framing things from their own perspectives and really thinking, you know, how then do we really need to do and what do we have to do, especially in terms of 
dismantling this whole narrative and you know, how can we actually find efforts and you know to really have such important discussions like this, especially in terms of the topic of racism and much more. Thanks so much, Rosanna, for that sharing. Now, without further ado, I would like to just move on to our final speaker, Mr. Edin Koo, who probably, you know, our, both our speakers have highlighted that he will be the, one of the good experts to share further on all those issues and parts. So, by, without further ado, you can just go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Edin Koo. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, um, thank you to Pusat Commerce for this invitation, to Gerald and uh, Rosanna, my uh, friends and colleagues on the, on the panel. Um, I'm given 10 to 15 minutes, I think, and I want to encourage, hopefully we can have some exchange, so uh, right at the stroke of 10, I'm, I will have another 10 minutes. I don't have a presentation, I think people should actually start listening to each other, rather than looking at some board. Uh, with statistics, which, as we all know, say so much, but tell us very little. Uh, and um, I think the point, um, uh, to begin with, I also hope to pepper some humor into this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to take off from where Rosanna left off and talk about uh, the need for a human approach uh, to understanding questions of race. Um, I also want to take off with Rosanna by... Uh, perhaps pointing out I am less pessimistic about the claim of every racist to first claim that they are not racist. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's a paradoxical uh, position that we find ourselves in. Uh, most uh, hardcore racists would have no problems calling or referring to themselves as racists uh, because the point of their racism is essentially the ejection of every other social reality beyond theirs. Uh, over here, when we say we are not racist before going on a racist barrage, at some level, we are conscious of the fact uh, that we live in a highly polyglot uh, and cosmopolitan society, and that somehow offensiveness must not offense or offend that much. Um, uh, is this something positive? I'm not sure, but at least it, it confuses the professor of this, uh, uh, um, this, this diatribe uh, that they go into. Um, I think um, the question of race and the question of uh, uh, racial discrimination uh, and the uh, um, breaking or the deluge of uh, sentiment, uh, communalist sentiment, uh, is not a thing that is unique to us. Uh, it is a thing that is now prevalent and permeating the world over. Uh, it has a lot to do with many, many deep and profound things like the crisis of the nation state. Uh, the ability of certain uh, of uh, communities to identify themselves with nations uh, rather than you know trans global and trans uh, um, um, engagement. We were very enthusiastic about globalization. If you remember in the late 80s and 1990s, now that there's a whole uh, reaction towards globalization on so many fronts, uh, the communalist, uh, even the racist um, uh, trend is one. Uh, the uh, uh, anti-capitalist trend is another. Uh, so we are really in a time of great transition, uh, except, uh, as Gramsci says, you know, the, that which is waiting to be born still cannot be born. And as Yates wonderfully said, you know, uh, 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 all things have fallen apart, right? Uh, and uh, anarchy is loosened upon the world as we make a decision about when, what we want to go. And, uh, where we want to go. And a lot of this, of course, is expressed in a great deal of tribalist, essentially, uh, doubt, circumspection, and, and fear. Um, I find myself, when talking about this issue, in a very curious position because I am not uh, generally an optimist. I am very pessimistic about human nature. Um, but uh, I also find myself somehow being uh, quite optimistic uh, when we hear so many horror stories about how bleak our future is. Uh, I think um, we did some incredible things uh, in the past uh, decade or so, uh, two years ago, at least just in terms of structures and in terms of political outlook. 
uh, you know, we, we, we got rid of essentially what is a very sclerotic uh, and decaying government, uh, only to realize we booted out Tweedledee uh, to invite Tweedledum into the seat. Uh, so uh, I think a, a lot of people are then uh, trying to adjust to a, to a supra or, or post-political uh, reality in grappling with these issues. Um, I also find myself in a curious position these days of someone not appreciating the anecdotal uh, to these days, constantly making various self-declarations uh, in an attempt to harness an argument. Um, I think one of our greatest strengths, not just in Malaysia, but in all of Southeast Asia, is that in reality and in essence, we are all cultural bastards. Uh, uh, we are a polyglot and mongrelized society and community. We have no other reality, and we can only escape from it that much uh, before we have to come to reconcile ourselves uh, with the fact that we are all at some level uh, multilingual, uh, cosmopolitan. Uh, and I think that has been the greatest uh, challenge of our system. Uh, uh, essentially, it's to break any sense or create and construct um, fake, fake um, identities, and that construction is still going on, fake hardened identities uh, against the realities of our history. So the problem with our society today is that we happen to fictionalize uh, and fantasize all the time about who we are and who we are not. Um, let me just uh, perhaps try and uh, give a solution uh, before I explain the problem. I think one of the things that we best we need to do is to be thoroughly invasive of each other's spaces uh, in order to break down this constructions of uh, racial identities and racial purities that are not actually ours. Um, I've been a lecturer for uh, close to three decades now, uh, apart from a, a, a kind of cultural bandit that goes into all these restricted spaces. Uh, I have a very um, interesting uh, intellectual background in the sense that uh, you know, I, 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 my first degree is in Islamic thought. Uh, I have deep rootings in uh, Islamic philosophy and thinking. Uh, and uh, 30 years ago, when they started to ban and proscribe all those cultural resources in, uh, that, that give us the strength uh, to understand and create empathy among communities, uh, they start invading this space using the law uh, and reductive language, essentially, to obliterate all these resources that can essentially help us reconcile ourselves with us as a difficult and complex society. Uh, so they get rid of the shadow play, the Wayakule, they get rid of the Mak Yong, uh, and when you get rid of the Mak Yong, you get rid of one aspect of Klantani society that looks at women, for example, in a very central place. Uh, they get rid of our ability to deal with things like gender fluidity and sexual fluidity, all those resources are gone uh, from our, from our um, uh, cultural foundations. Uh, and what we are replaced with are borrowed traditions and borrowed systems uh, from elsewhere and a borrowed language from elsewhere that then alienates uh, parts of our society and so we are incredibly fractured. And our constant resolution to all these problems is to find legal means of resolving them. Legis some more legislation, more legislation, more enactment. These things are very necessary, don't get me wrong. Yeah? Uh, but we need to create an organic language that uh, stems from ourselves um, uh, to, to, to be able to craft a language that is understandable and uh, is, can be empathized with uh, everybody. Um, many years ago, for example, uh, YB was involved with Hindraf. Hindraf was a very interesting case because uh, I reported on it for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, a fairly extensive show about for one and a half years. And I remember uh, asking the um, Home Minister at that time, Tan Sri Said Hamid Alba, um, a, a very actually agreeable man. I could actually get along with him very well. And, uh, you know, he came up with all these legal arguments. But the moment a cultural argument was presented to him, uh, he was left tongue-tied. You know, he had never seen the problem in this kind of way. What about you know, the realities of, of uh, working Indians here? What about their history? What about, right? It's never been presented. Uh, and I think uh, this is one of the resources that we need to fall back 
on. Uh, I think um, our system has become so sophisticated in that it creates fabrications without even realizing it. Uh, and in very subtle but uh, very uh, destructive ways. Last year, for example, we commemorated the 50 years of the Rukunagara. Whatever people think of the Rukunagara, it is one of the foundations of the landscapes upon which we were supposed to find spaces in which we can interact uh, and speak about things like, uh, I hate the term national unity, but okay, for national unity. And what do they do? Uh, they actually debauched the term Rukunagara. Rukunagara is a compound noun. It comes as one word. Uh, and what they have done is they debauched it and they made it two words. Rukun Nagara, you know, national principles. Uh, even in that sense, our memory has been so assaulted, uh, as I said, by a system that is now running on auto drive. Yeah? People are not even commanding it. Uh, we go back to other things. We talk about a social contract. Yes, but we don't know how to dif differentiate between an implicit social contract and an explicit social contract, both of which then have become confused. Uh, we, uh, we refer to a term like special privileges when there is none. It is special positions. And then after that, we conflate further special, uh, you know, the perversion of special position to special privileges to hegemony. Uh, so, and that happens, you know, in, in, in such a, uh, uh, such a um, sometimes unintended way even. It just takes on these phantoms. Uh, my cause for optimism, of course, is that uh, I am one of those people who invades spaces. Um, I, uh, my job as a journalist, my job as a researcher, my job working with uh, cultural traditions that, as I said, have been proscribed, uh, come under the hammer of the laws and fatwas, and as a result, obliterates entire historical realities uh, from our, 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 our um, uh, cultural history. And uh, worst of all, it basically, uh, it basically severs our tongues, you know. Uh, we aren't able to construct a language that is ours, uh, that is born from our historical reality. Uh, for example, look at, a, uh, look at a reality like Malacca, uh, the Sultanate of Malacca, which was never known as the Sultanate of Malacca during its time. It was just known as the Anthropod of Malacca. Uh, and uh, when... Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Tome Pires was sent by uh, Queen, Alex uh, um, Prince, uh, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand uh, to do a reconnaissance of, of Malacca prior to invasion. Uh, he arrived and he stayed here and he wrote the first encyclopedia of the East called the Summa, Summa Era Oriental, Orientalis. Uh, and I think uh, he wrote back missives to the palace of uh, uh, of Portugal, where he described in very glowing terms this amazing cosmopolitan society called Malacca, where at any given spot, at any given spot, nothing less than 90 different languages were being spoken. Uh, the Malacca Sultanate, the Malacca Kingdom, for example, uh, was made up of half-breeds uh, and diplomats and uh, advisors from all around the region, from China, from India. Tunpera, as you know, had Tamil blood. Uh, all those things are not then become part of our uh, everyday cultural reality to speak about. So I think our problem with race uh, is a lot more inimical than we allow ourselves to think. Legislation alone will not help this. We must root ourselves in deep cultural and historical realities here. So I am very often a lot more interested in engaging in things like debates about our history textbooks than the kind of laws and enactments that we need in parliament, which need to be done, but the concurrent thing is not being done. Every time we bring something like the Tanglung issue, uh, please also be quite uh, positive and encourage that a lot of people just don't care about this rubbish. And they go on with their, with their lived realities, yeah? which is a very mixed one, actually. Uh, uh, and when we begin to invade those spaces, enter those spaces, uh, there is no Malay Kampong in this country, for example, who will halal you because you are Chinese. Uh, 
In fact, they are, <laughs> they, they, they are often very, very welcoming. I, I do this, this is part of my job, you know, just to enter into, in, in, into states and into districts and into regions uh, to discover cultural traditions and what they say uh, about uh, uh, and how they can address uh, questions of this kind. So if you notice, a lot of our cultural issues are subliminal. Yeah. They're not legal. Uh, all this uh, infestation of race identities are built into things like Tanglung controversy, uh, Allah, uh, should Zakir Naik be sent back? Um, you know, Zakir Naik, for example, is a very interesting, is a very interesting case. Uh, because Zakir Naik is a buffoon. Uh, he is not a master of comparative religion. Uh, he's just got a very good memory. That's what he has. Uh, that he has millions of followers uh, is the reason for concern. Uh, but again, here we are caught in a paradox. Can we send him back to a country that is persecuting Muslims at the moment? Uh, because that's part of the process uh, of Hindutva, BJP, under there. Um, so, these are very, very difficult and complex questions that we need to, uh, I think, talk about. Um, but I think uh, right now, the one thing that we really should pay a great deal of attention to uh, is what our cultural history is. How do we inform and how do we allow people to participate in that uh, 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 dialogue on, on, on cultural history? Uh, I think the core point about a lot of questions of racism, of racial difference, of xenophobia, uh, stems from the fact that we allow uh, forces to increasingly make our cultural realities and our cultural discourse very reductive. Yeah? There are no hardcore cultural identities uh, in this cultural landscape. There never has been, uh, and we need to be able to deal with that kind of complexity. The other thing that I think we need to invest a great deal of time and uh, effort in is to really discover a whole new language uh, that is rooted in our cultural realities uh, to begin to negotiate and talk about these things. These are very difficult things to do. They're very deeply philosophical, they're highly intellectual, um, uh, but they are very, very um, possible and capable. I think uh, a lot of our religious identities and hard uh, cultural identities and racial identities uh, are also um, built in with this culture of victimology that is permeating all of us. Yeah. Uh, in Malaysia, every community believes itself to be a victim of the other. Uh, and I think this needs to be grappled with. And a lot of that has to be done. Where does it start? This, this is a major uh, problem. Does it start in schools? I'm also quite tired of getting into the debate of schools. Uh, they are rotten. They're going to be rotten for a very long time. Uh, so w how do we actually uh, work? Uh, uh, and this is where I think kind of guerrilla efforts are needed. Uh, so, uh, as Rosanna said, spaces, independent, independent spaces need to be created. Uh, I think there have been some very positive things that have happened in terms of uh, um, uh, cultural realities changing, people reconciling themselves. Uh, I, for example, am involved with so very many, most of them Malay-based and Malay-language-speaking. Malay um, uh, communities that are really looking to seek uh, to dis rediscover history, dis rediscover their, 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 their cultural place. Uh, I'm less sanguine about uh, non-Malay communities who seem to have bought into the whole idea of victimology almost wholesale. Uh, I'm very also uh, troubled by very glib and easy efforts uh, to, of cultural borrowings to describe our situation. Uh, Malaysia is not apartheid. Apartheid was a very specific kind of system. Uh, I was an anti-apartheid activist as a student. Uh, I know what those realities are and they certainly are not present in this country. Uh, I was uh, maybe equally dire, but they are a lot more nuanced. And I think when we begin to acknowledge these kinds of things, it also gives us a better command of what our issues are. Uh, so I think a great deal of work needs to be done. And a great deal of work needs to be done essentially in interrogating our cultural realities, in interrogating our history, and essentially in, in, in constructing uh, a language uh, that really reflects us. Uh, of course, that, that comparative, we always need comparative references. 
but we must be able to uh, understand ourselves a little more and how we have interacted for centuries because that is the resource. And once you have that knowledge, uh, that is the uh, ability by which you subvert uh, what is systemically and structurally done essentially to uh, reduct, make our society and make our consciousness a lot more reductive. Uh, so I'll stop there and open for uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nidin. Um, I think for the very insight and you know how we can also come out and present different approaches to addressing, especially in terms of course, laws and legislations have often been a tool, right? I like mentioned, you know, to try to reduce such issues. But of course, then you need to bring in the cultural understanding so that we can also understand and you know try to empathize on what's actually happening on the ground. Now, uh, without further ado, what I'm going to do is um, we have friends who have joined us here online and I think this is where we can have this uh, conversation. Especially you can ask those questions to our speakers who are in front there. For those who are present here physically, you can see that there are two microphones uh, at the, in the middle. So you can always go to the microphone and then you can ask your question. Of course, then I will be able to see and I will just give you the floor. And for those of you who are joining me online, I'm just looking on the screen now. If you have any questions, please, by all means, you can use the raise hand function online so that we can ask uh, and then we can project you so that those who are here physically will be able to see your face as well. And so please unmute yourself if you are, if you are interested to ask a question. All right, so without further ado, um, anyone wants to... Yes, Siti, please. Okay, so if you are there online, please just raise hand functions. So yeah, send Marshall. I will pass it to you after this. Yeah, Siti, please. Yes, okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Siti. Um, I'm a lawyer by profession. Uh, well, thank you very much from the presenters and everything. I'm just a bit disappointed because really we all know what the problems are in this country. There's no need to repeat the same things that we all know. But what is the solution, really? I mean, uh, for me, we need to find a solution now in order to resolve this problem that you are having. And it's getting worse. For example, I just saw from uh, social media, uh, our Kamus Bahasa Melayu from the Dewan Bahasa and Pustaka, actually, <coughs> if you put Tambi, the word Tambi, and then the definition will come out as satu panggilan untuk orang keling yang lebih muda daripada kita. This is day one bahasa and pustaka, okay? And they are using a very degrading word for the Hindus. So where are we going right now? So I really, really think that we need to find a solution by suggesting what can our politicians do? Because currently, the only way to resolve our problem is from parliament. And the parliamentarians that we have, I'm sorry, they are all really useless. Uh, they are only for their own powers. You know, they are fighting whether they can stay on uh, holding power, that's all. They don't care what is happening on the ground. Whilst all this, the government also endorsed, I'm not just talking about this current government, the previous government as well, you know, Pakatan Harapan or BN or PN or whatever they call themselves, no one dares to tackle the real elephant in the room. Why do we get racism? It's because the way the people in Malaysia have the majority of Malaysian, which are the Malays, I am a Malay, I'm not anti-Malay, I am not anti-religion, but the way the Malays have been taught or being informed with facts which are totally mis, uh, misleading from history, geography, everything. Our children now being brainwashed with fake news. What are we going to do about it? We are never going to solve our problem with this racism if we do not tackle the real core issue which is the root of the problem. The brainwashing of our children and the Malays. Through religion. Really, that is really the core issue. We need to tackle that. You know, I mean, we know the politicians are using religion for their own benefit. But, you know, this is why we need to put good people in parliament. You know, even Pakatan Harapan would not dare to touch this issue 
because he's sensitive. Why do you think that lawyer, what's his name, Muhammad Khairul Azam, came out with ridiculous uh, kind of uh, statement and even taking legal action? He's a, oh, sorry. He's a, he's a lawyer. But why, you know, why, why does he come out with this stupid interpretation of our federal constitution? Because I do believe some of our lawyers that have been taught in our local universities by certain lecturers mislead them about Islam in the federal constitution. Right. So yeah. thank you very much. That's Thanks. my question. Thanks, Siti, for the, 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 the question as well. So, so the question to the speakers would be, what is the solution really? You know, we already know about all these issues. How do we and how and what can we do to tackle the elephant in the room? But before I pass it to the speakers, I saw one hand earlier. Is Senator Marshall Celia? Yes, please, Senator. I hope we can hear you here as well. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I would uh, like to ask. Uh, uh, first of all, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the city for mentioning how important it is uh, for the education system to become more liberal. Thanks, Senator. So, yeah, uh, we have two questions. Um, then perhaps we can get our speakers to respond to them first. Then after that, we can open to the next uh, next set of questions. So, yeah, maybe to answer City's question, you know, we already know what are we going to do to address the elephant in the room, and perhaps to eat in that specific question to you, you know, in terms of the hierarchy and in terms of colorism and much more. You know, how then do you respond to that? So, who wants to take the floor first? Eden. Okay. Yeah. Gerald, oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, speakers are finding their way. <laughs> All right, yeah. City. Yes. Hello. Okay. All right. Um. Uh, yeah. All of us, I think, are frustrated with the situation. You know, because we have been talking about it for a long time. I think there was. Um, some semblance of hope of getting somewhere um, when Pakatan Harapan came in to be able to do something and bring some sort of reform or at least, you know, where we are, we, we, are, we were starting to have conversations, lah, you know, with, you know, amongst the right, yeah, and then um, with, with um, the politicians, with, with those who are, who are in power. You know, and all of those things that you talked about in relation to the education system, we've been it's, it's painful. It's painful because, especially for people who do not have any other options but to go to our national schools, you know. So our, our problems, I, I, I think, you know, um, it's all tied up with where we are right now. Um, I don't have any quick answers, to be honest, you know, which is why I find 
um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, I, I think we all need to work together uh, and look at all the recommendations that have been done in, in addressing you know, uh, systems of education. How do we uh, talk about... But at the end of the day, it's also the narrative in public. Yeah? How do we actually get more people, more positive voices out? And that's why I think you know, the smaller group conversations is actually very critical and important as well. Yeah, because it's one thing in terms of having to deal with policies, it's also one thing to, have to, to be dealing with the law. Um, but, but we are also not talking to each other. You know, and that's the painful truth. You know, we, are, we, we struggle to build communities. We struggle to build communities with common ground. Um, and I know, you know, this is not a satisfactory answer because I don't, I don't know if I have the answer, you know. All of this is just percolating in the mind all the time. Each time something new comes up, you know, you're having to grapple with how people are reacting to that current discourse, you know. And it's, it's, it, it zaps away all our attention. And what we really need to do is to figure out how do we work at this in the long term. Because it is a, we need a long-term solution, you know. Um, how do we dismantle, you know, um, a, a pool? You know, we don't agree with people um, who, who speak, you know, in, in certain ways when it comes to religion. But how do we engage with them? Um, engaging is one thing, but uh, and, yeah, because, because we do believe in democracy, we also have to, you know, how, where do we find these spaces to come to some kind of agreement, you know, or is it a compromise, or do we not compromise at all, then what do we do with the people that we disagree with? Um, these are very difficult questions, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I've come to the point where um, uh, what having conversations with with people I don't know is is important. And secondly, I think you know this whole thing about you know um, this whole issue of constituting religion. I think this is where you know this is the reality that we have to deal with as well, in terms of you know how certain issues are being dealt with within the law, and how religion comes to play into it. And so I would like to cheekily uh, do a pitch that there's going to be a public forum on this, this Saturday. Um, and I think it's a very important issue to kind of really, you know, to that whole thing about going back in history and understanding, you know, how did we get here when it comes to dealing with Islam and the state. Yeah. Sorry, Siti, kalau you disappointed in my response. I, I'm also... Yeah. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sit, yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Siti. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, Eden, you want to respond? No. Uh, I'll check on the uh, speaker there first before I address uh, uh, Siti Kasim's uh, thing. Yeah. Um, I don't understand what statues he was talking about. Francis Light, is it? Uh, and uh, maybe Swetnam, uh, and then his reference to the Black Lives Matter. Uh, Black, Lives, Black Lives Matter is very important, but as I said, it's only a reference point for us. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, phenomenon uh, among Malaysians and many other Asians living in, in, uh, in, in Western countries or lecturing in Western universities uh, to essentially constantly conflate the experience over there with us over here. Uh, they are different experiences, and while they are reference points, no doubt, and they are comparative bridges, uh, I'm, I'm, I was talking a great deal about how we need to create a language and a reference point from our own cultural realities and our own historical realities, uh, and not participate in the kind of expressions of white guilt, essentially, that are seizing campuses uh, all over the United Kingdom and the United States. Uh, this is what... Uh, the uh, African Nobel Prize winner Wole Shoyenka called neo uh, It's still a colonial state of the mind. Uh, and whatever happens in Western campuses uh, happened to liberate us at the same time. 
so I don't understand what the confusion was on, on his part. Uh, again, education system, yes, yes, yes. I say yes to everything. I say yes to Siti Kasim also. We need better political leaders. We need better, uh, you know, and if she stood my constituency, i definitely vote for her. Uh, but uh, uh, there are many other things that also need to be done. And there are many other places where these things are also being done in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, intellectual reconciliation, in terms, as I said, invading spaces. I totally agree, 130% if possible with Siti Kasim, that the core of the problem is conditioning, you know. And in our country, it takes the, 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 it, it takes, uh, uh, the, the role of religious conditioning. Uh, in other places, it takes the care of racial conditioning. Look at Brexit. That's also conditioning. A conditioning of xenophobia and bigotry. Right? Um, so I agree with everything. But what I'm saying is uh, I'm trying to provide a sense that there are also all these subversions going on uh, at the moment. Uh, Dewan Bahasa comes up with ridiculous things like that every day. Uh, and we have to take it very seriously. And we have to confront them and interrogate them. But at the same time, Dewan Bahasa is one of those institutions that is lampooned and satirized every single day. We have people now who, for example, religious edicts, uh, people who consider themselves uh, deeply pious and religious, who are constantly lampooning and satirizing uh, religious figures. I think this is a position of strength and we need to build from those kinds of things, even as we... Uh, work on the more immediate exigencies of getting b better people in parliament, of actually holding a lot of our leaders accountable. We have to also acknowledge that we have at the same time all these kinds of very subversive uh, things going on uh, at the moment. Uh, as I said, 30 years ago, uh, I'm, I went into Kelantan. Uh, just two days uh, after the pass uh, led um, Angkatan Perpaduan Umah, APU government at that time, uh, you know, who had promised uh, uh, a, basically a, a revolution in Klantanese society, getting rid of all these kinds of, of uh, bad habits like drinking, gambling and everything. And after that, a more important uh, and more elusive and more nuanced thing was said to change the Malay Muslim mindset by getting rid of its history, essentially, right? It's impure history. Uh, and just on the eve, 30 years ago, I went there, uh, and I worked with many people on the ground, built kinship networks, uh, and, you know, we didn't confront the law, but we subverted it all the time. 30 years later, the traditions are still very alive. In, instead, being performed, uh, with greater tenacity and greater vigor than ever. Young people are very involved. I think all these things need to be acknowledged as a certain resourcefulness from uh, communities and people who, are simply, who simply refused to be duped and fooled and uh, uh, made idiotic by their leaders. So yes, I agree with uh, uh, Siti Kasim very much. Uh, and again, I reiterate, please stand in Lamba Pantai, I will vote for you. I will campaign for you, I will speak for you. Uh, but at the same time, let us also acknowledge uh, that a lot of this is going on. We acknowledge that because that is the, the foundation and base upon which we build that movement to do exactly what Siti Kasim uh, said has done. And we did it, huh? 2018, despite all the ghouls we had to vote in again, uh, uh, we voted for the agenda, but as I said, we kicked out Tweedledee Tweedle only to invite Tweedledum. Okay, so maybe there's a level of maturity that will come again, but let us acknowledge those spaces where these things are happening on a daily basis. Yeah, uh, I'm not going to pick up on, I agree with the comments. Uh, thanks, Siti. Uh, just on Dr. Senan, I think uh, Eden, what he was probably trying to say was the... Um, when the Black Lives Matters happen, you're right, it's a reference point. Uh, but many who commented online uh, in Malaysia, many Malay groups commented and saw themselves in relation to the, the Black Empowerment Movement in the US, forgetting that here, this was a majority framework that was oppressing or enabling an oppression of minority. I think that's what he was trying to, to show the, the inconsistency of analysis not realizing that here, although that's just only a reference point, 
hear the privilege, the uh, access that they have to many things, they don't see that in the same power dynamics. Uh, so, so that was, I think, the irony. Uh, while it's a reference point, many Malaysians from the Malay majority was not able to reference that as how do we treat those, I think he used the word colorism, but those minority others, uh, other groups in Malaysia vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Black Lives Matter. But I think that's the, uh, so I think a lot more work needs to be done. And I think uh, well, City's point is that what should we do? Many, we get better politicians, but if the other frameworks are not there, the cultural connectedness is not there, the legal policy framework is not there. So I think the fight is done at many levels. And uh, so I think we need to keep up that fight. Uh, uh, but I think we'll get more questions and maybe we'll take on. Thank you. All right. Thanks, uh, speakers. Um, I think, yes, as they mentioned, you know, it's a multi-pronged approach. It cannot be only a one-way approach to solve the issue because it's a very complex issue. So, yeah, I'm going to open one final set of questions. So, by all means, if anyone who are interested, both physically and virtually, you can just come forward uh, and just take the space. And, you know, for those who are online, I'm looking here. If you have any questions, please use the raise hand function. And for those who are asking, yes, we will be having the recording. So we will be uploading them so that you can revisit them after the conference. Yes. So we have one physically. Anyone from virtually? Okay, I don't see any hands. So, yes, we will get a physical one first. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Andrew Koo. Uh, I happen to co-chair the Bar Council's... Uh, Constitutional Law Committee. Uh, just uh, Andrew, a can you go question. nearer to the microphone? Okay. Yeah. Okay. A general question to, to all the speakers. Um, in 1957, when the Malaya Constitution was uh, written, uh, Article 152 basically said that the national language shall be Malay, the Malay language. And if you read the Malay language version, it says Bahasa Melayu. Um, Post-1969, in an attempt to unite the country, uh, you see an official reference to our national language as Bahasa Malaysia. So notwithstanding what's in the constitution, we talked about Bahasa Malaysia, then you see a lot of campaigns about Bahasa Jiwa Bangsa, the idea of trying to promote, inculcate a national identity based on the concept of Malaysia. But you fast forward now in the last maybe uh, at least 10 years or so, we have gone back to insisting that the national language is Bahasa Melayu. Uh, and it almost sort of uh, shadows the, the, the national journey from uh, you know, 1957, uh, a plural society, different communities coming together to perhaps a, a post-1969 dream of a multiracial society, multicultural society. And then now, we seem to quite readily accept in writings that we live in a plural society once again. We've gone from plural society to attempt to multiracial society back to a plural society. And that seems to me to keep people separate. And so, you know, when you are separate, you foment suspicion and that sort of thing. So I just, the question I suppose to, to the panel is, you know, are we on the right track? You know, should we uh, be, should we go back to trying to become a multiracial society? Or should we just happily accept the reality that we are a plural society with everybody having their own communal interests? And what then bodes for the future of Malaysia. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. I saw one hand online. Mitch, yeah, can we have you on the screen, please? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a question. We know, I mean, at this point, we know what are the things that happen. Um, the idiotic leader, the repression of democracy, the education system, the lack of diversity and inclusion, the political decay. So many things that led from the current chaos and disorder. But I have also noticed that many young people are also open to learning 
and accepted. So I'm asking you how to handle it. To want to be to shift the current democratic landscape, to have young and more women taking the reins in the country and in the current democratic landscape, feedback for such. Thanks, Mitch, um, all right, for the question. So I think there are two questions which are raised for the panelists. Um, are there anyone else before we close the question and answer session? All right, okay, if there, there isn't any. All right, so yeah. All right, so those are the two questions which are raised for the speakers or the panelists to answer. So first question by Andrew, are we on the right, right track? or how, what, what are we actually are today. And then secondly, you know, it's like, we need to, by Mitch, we need to shift the landscape to have more young or more women, but is the current democratic landscape ready for it? So these are the two questions um, that we have for our panelists, and then perhaps you can also give your closing remarks uh, to just end this session. Yeah. So can I know who's going to go first? Language expert. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. We are a society in gravitation. Uh, I think, as I said, even racists acknowledge that we are a multiracial society. So they want to qualify what they, the racist things they say first by saying I'm not racist. So there's some kind of consciousness there. Uh, there is a lot of conditioning uh, going on, of course, but I also don't want to get trapped in what are, what are very nonsense and silly uh, debates that uh, make the entire uh, debate that we need to have uh, reductive, as I say. I have no problems with Bahasa Melayu. My Bahasa Melayu is extremely fluent and engaging. I'm well-versed in Malay literature, oral history, and classical history, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and so um, uh, nobody can, then can impose that silly Bahasa Melayu uh, um, imposition on me uh, and shut me up at that level, you see. <laughs> there is actually no language called Bahasa Malaysia. There is Bahasa Melayu, the Malay language. Uh, it was used after that Bahasa Malaysia to be inclusive, but if that's going to be a trope, and that's going to be a place that leads me uh, to the swamp, uh, then I'm not going to participate in it. It's very easy to subvert that kind of thing. Just say, uh, okay, la, fine, Bahasa Melayu, speak it very well, and then you take the debate to another level upon which those people cannot, uh, because they don't actually have the knowledge. Uh, it's uh, very interesting, you know, a lot of Katuana people, uh, you know, fighting for these things or for Malays and that things for Malays, don't know very much about the Malays at all. Uh, so the moment you do, they are, they are very wary about approaching you. Uh, this is one of the very interesting things I found in Kelantan with the past state government, for example. I'm a journalist, I'm a reporter, so I get along with them very well. And uh, everybody in the, in, in, um, in, in the past state government at that time realized what a nonsense law that was. Uh, but it was very easy to, uh, to, 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 to reductivize uh, by saying halal haram. You, know, you create this very black and white view of the world. But the moment you have somebody there who's willing to speak out from the, the tradition itself, uh, and including on religious uh, examples, then they just leave you alone and just let you do what you want uh, uh, to do. I think we, we in Malaysia have to be a lot more uh, sophisticated in our uh, guerrilla warfare attempts, lah. our cultural guerrilla warfare attempts. Um, and I, I think that goes a, 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 a long way. Uh, so I think we really need to not allow ourselves to be trapped at uh, Jibba uh, by all these uh, silly factors that get us all riled up, you know. Uh, but as I said, this is what I mean by to be really rooted in our cultural and historical realities uh, and be engaged um, uh, with people who are doing these acts of subversion and they are happening a lot and they contributed a lot to the uh, change in mindset uh, that resulted in that, you know, in that very realistic thing to do, vote out. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, we, we need to get away from these traps. Lah. Uh, we also need to get away from a certain kind of language uh, of uh, multiracial, pluralist, and all that. We have to accept our bastardy. That's what it is. Bahasa Lia is very important, you know. Uh, and the most dynamic things in, in, in Malay culture and Malay 
uh, 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 ways of subversion are in this aspect of lia and nakal. You know, uh, we, we, I, I, I took Wayan Troop for example. This is a very interesting anecdote, and I'll end here. Um, I went. We went to the United States for a 40-day tour, uh, well, shadow puppet uh, tour. We performed in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Rialto Theater, where James Brown made his debut. Fantastic, right? Uh, but a very instructive thing happened. Uh, I took my group of uh, uh, musicians who live in Macha and Kelantan, uh, and among the group of musicians and artists are four very young people between the ages of 14 and 20. And this was when the Kalima Allah issue was burning, really, 2014, 2015. And we went to Martin Luther King's church. Very will willingly, everybody went in. And as we went out, my Pachis laughed at each other and said, Tak jadi Christian pun? Okay. Uh, and then we went to uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Memorial Museum. And uh, I gave a tour with the young boys in particular. Very smart. Uh, kampung boys, huh? really kampung boys. Um, uh, Sekolah Kebangsaan Macang and all these things. Uh, very, but very committed to, to this cult cultural exchange. And they came out of that experience and they asked me one question. They say, why do we not talk about these things in our schools? Okay, so, so, so there is a lot of that uh, on the ground uh, and I think that needs to be tapped. I think we need to do a lot more work by going and engaging these communities. Uh, we sit a lot in conference halls like this and, and talk very abstractly about things we need to do. But I think we need to, as I said, you know, really fine-tune our guerrilla efforts, guerrilla warfare efforts, and reach out to a country that is, actually has its hands out to almost all of us. Yeah? That needs to be done. Thanks, Sidin. Yeah, perhaps. Where's that now, Jared? Yeah. Um, I think what we are, you know, in all these issues of our language, um, as well as, you know, um, the issue of inclusivity and change, I think what we are definitely lacking of and suffering of is actually the lack of the leaders that we want. You know, there is no leadership out there that is capturing our imaginations and showing us the Malaysia that, you know, that they, that they can bring us to and that we want to go along with them. Um, it's been um, very much, you know, a leadership of self-interest. And I think um, even on both sides, yeah, um, and, and without that, you know, without a leader or, or the leadership telling us that, you know, we can be a nation that is diverse in so many ways, inclusive in so many ways, accepting of the young people, accepting of more women, you know, in important and leadership positions, you know, without them saying it, I think what we have to do is maybe say this louder, you know, so that other people can be, if they're not willing to say it, then I think we, we need to say it louder. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Actually, I'm uh, quite stunned for answers because the questions are the correct questions. Answers about what to do next, uh, shift landscape. We, we've been talking about it, I think it's the 10th national conference. I think Eden said that we sit here to discuss uh, how to shift landscape, uh, because I think both there's potential and we also victims. So when you, we talk about the young people, or in this case the women, uh, we are all part of this roja in terms of mind and hearts. And we also have to unpack our own, what's inside ourselves and not our belief system. So it's, it's, uh, it's not like a magic formula, suddenly the young people will stand up to be different from you and I, you know. They, they, they go through the same WhatsApp we are discussing, the same gameplay, the same fear. So, so I, I, I'm realizing that the, the tough call for us would be how to inspire. I think, Edin, you gave a good example, that Martin Luther King Museum. I mean, yeah, of course, we got our uh, embassy ambassador here, U.S. embassy here. So one way is to get more cultural, inspirational experience. But I'm thinking, Edin, what about in Malaysia? Those kind of trips to the Lumba Bujang, to the Parakman Cave, to the Chinese uh, new villages. And they all have some small story, different kampung, but we've not had 
those kind of ground museums where we can take school kids to go. Of course, we get to go to another country, it's inspiring. So I'm, I'm just realizing that this kind of inspiring moments that ask the, the, those critical questions are not, not enough. What we need to deal with is countering, as uh, Siti said, those uh, political games by uh, politicians and organizations. So we're always answering that. and we, get, we ourselves get trapped. We are answering a narrative already set up. So we're not able to grow something else. And I think this probably is my, uh, my takeaway from this discussion to both um, uh, Rosanna and uh, Edin also that uh, like uh, Suhakam and uh, Komas and many other groups, we've been very uh, looking at the, like the national, uh, the, the blueprint, the national unity blueprint, policy frameworks, and UCC. But we've got very little traction and movement from that end because every five years something changes, words change, but we ourselves are a little bit disbelieving whether that will, will change. Because I think, Rosanna, you're right, we don't see the leaders who will inspire and be committed to it, whatever the cost may be. The day I see a politician who would stand by the national action blueprint for national, uh, sorry, the blueprint for national unity, at all costs, then I know we found the person, which means he or she may lose the next election. If that person is willing to stand up and lose the next election, I'm hoping he doesn't lose, then I know we found that leader. But usually the compromise happens at... Uh, a calculation of how much I say or how lo loud I say based on whether I can win or not. And I think that's why we have not found enough leaders while they are politicians. We, we, we find some good people when they retire, you know, then they speak up. But, you know, by then they are like us sitting in conference hall halls and talking. But I just take this as my own reflection. But I think we need to find new inspirational uh, points on the ground. And I think Malaysia has a lot. Uh, in different corners of the kampongs, the goa goa, that I think maybe we should start a new trail uh, of learning and inspiration. Thank you. Yeah, Aline wanted to add a bit. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, uh, maybe to answer that, that very direct point. First of all, on leadership, yeah. Um, there is political leadership, there's all kinds of other leadership. Sisters in Islam is leadership. Siti Qasim is leadership. Uh, that kind of concentration or breakdown of leadership has happened now over the past 20 years and it's a very positive progressive thing. Uh, Orangasli communities, uh, I work culturally with a lot of them, the Mameri, the Tamuan and so on. The ability of the Orang Asli today, yes, horrible things are happening in terms of land and, and uh, invasion of all kinds of from property, ancestral uh, uh, rights and all these kinds of things are happening. But the ability of the Orang Asli today to articulate is a lot stronger than it was 30 or 40 years ago. You know, uh, that's leadership also. But uh, to answer that very direct question, we need to assault the concentration of power. Uh, we need to devolve power from parliament and institutions alone to have a more grassroots-based uh, democratic process, local councillors and so on. Uh, there's one political position I want to stand for, and that is mayor of Kuala Lumpur, uh, which was promised by Tweedledum. Uh, Tweedledee refused, but Tweedledum said they would do it and then didn't. Uh, so see what I mean by Tweedledee and Tweedledum? Uh, so that's, you know, in terms of our... Uh, uh, a real approach to assaulting the concentration of power. That's the one thing we need to do first. Call for a devolution uh, of political power from very centralized uh, authority. Thanks so much, because I think uh, they are given their valuable input and so their feedback in terms of some of the questions. I believe, you know, as they were speaking, then I'm seeing hands being raised online and also questions that were raised. I think there are one who asked in terms of, like, you know, asking the speakers to comment the relations between the discourse of citizenship and race. However, uh, for this session, we are almost, I mean, we are already out of time, but we can continue these conversations later. So it's just not, it does not stop here. Right, so um, in that sense, you know, the next part will be a lot in terms of our group discussions that we'll be having. So we'll be having and continuing this discussion later uh, and much more. But just to sum up some of the key points, I think really, you know, we have really explored a lot in terms of the different realities that we are facing here in Malaysia, you know, especially in terms of, and all of us are aware, politicians and the others, they are all some of them. And some of the issues that we are, are already something that we have already known. But again, to, uh, 
approach and to really address these issues, we cannot only approach from a single approach, looking at laws and legislation, but we need to look at the multi-pronged approach. And in that sense, I really agree with whatever uh, Edin has mentioned, you know, we need to try to assert the concentration of power and really, you know, to have more grassroots-based voice to be heard today. And I think that's what all of us are striving and moving to go on with. And, you know, let's keep this in mind because the next part we'll be discussing further with regards to what then can be as the normal Malaysians or even we as normal friends could do to really address this issue of racism and how it could fundamentally lead to extremism in the uh, long term. And with, thank you. with that, I would like to close this session and of course I will pass it back to our, our MC for today. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ryan, for moderating this session. I, I hope that uh, we, have, we have a very engaging discussion just now.